Hi, uh, my name is Asher Lazday, and I'm the team leader for Saudi Arabia Iran Team A. Um, and I'm joined by Nicole Fernandez, Anastasia Marku, sorry, and Angela Yu. Uh, so let's get started. So I think um, particularly vital to sort of understanding these presentations in general is to just get like a current and like very brief understanding of what the United States approach has largely been in the Saudi Arabia Iran conflict and what has really been have been the defining features of that conflict. And basically, we see them as such. Uh, the conflict has largely been over which nation will play a larger role in shaping the region, that is Saudi Arabia or Iran. And you've then seen flashpoints where in Saudi Arabia and Iran have been directly or indirectly confronting each other, Yemen, Syria, Qatar, Iraq, etc. Uh, and finally, and most importantly, specifically for us, is to understand that in the status quo, uh, the United States' intervention has been largely and heavily in favor of Saudi Arabia. Now. Um, now that we've gotten to understand what we've been doing, let's take a step back further and actually understand what the United States is and the other regional actors' goals are as we see them in the region. We, similarly to Team B, see the United States' goals as threefold. First is stable oil production. Second is preventing the spread of global terror. And finally is maintaining a minimal troop presence in the region. Now, to understand the importance of oil, and obviously this has come up repeatedly, you got, it's important to remember that around one-third of global oil production is, is, is from the Middle East. And given terrorist proclivity to bomb pipelines, close, uh, possibly closing the Strait of Hormuz, and um, bombing oil fields, it's clear that this is a very real threat in the region. Secondly, uh, because terrorists use instability and economic distress as, in, as their main recruiting tactics, preventing the spread of global terror and preventing instability in the region is the best way that Team A sees to prevent global terror in the long run. Now, it's important to remember that the United States fundamentally should be following these goals, not any specific actor, because their goals frequently are not exactly the same as ours. And that takes us on to Saudi goals. We believe that Saudi Arabia has three main goals as well regional hegemony, rolling back Iranian influence, and utilizing U.S. power to attain the previous two goals. It's been clear and made even clearer that Saudi Arabia thinks that the United States is and always will be its main alliance in the region, and largely anything that they do, we will support. Uh, repeatedly, we've seen that the heads of uh, Saudi state have asked the United States, in fact, directly for commitments of troops, for commitments of weapons, and we haven't always said yes, and we'd like to be clear that we don't always have their same goals. Uh, so let's continue. Finally, Iranian goals. They have two. First is rolling back Saudi influence, and then the second is survival despite the other actors in the region, namely the United States, Saudi Arabia, and, Israeli, uh, and Israel. Now, understanding that, we can see that, in fact, balancing is the most effective way to get involved in this region, because there are other actors that can get involved. But let's understand the threat of greater involvement that Team B and the path that Team B would take us down. First is greater regional instability. The assumption that greater U.S. involvement will necessarily be easy and immediately lead to the, uh, to the outcome that they want is not accurate. Now, even if you assume that, Sa that an ideal uh, Middle East would be run entirely by Saudi Arabia, the under what you, one has to understand is you don't get from point A to point B immediately. While you, one would try to attain Saudi hegemony in the region, there would be an incredible amount of regional instability, long-term commitment of troops or uh, boats around um, Yemen. And, uh, and that's something that we aren't willing to continue with. Now, um, there's also what we've coined a uh, tendency towards do something policies. The assumption that everything that happens in the Middle East, the United States has an answer to. Just because there is a conflict somewhere doesn't mean that the United States is best able to deal with it or that we need to be backing some actor that's already dealing with it. At times, these actors are able to do with, deal with it more effectively than they would be with our help. Uh, finally, the threat of greater involvement is an unintentional strengthening of the Saudi-United States alliance. Again, the assumption that we will always have the Sa their Saudis back, the assumption that in some regard we're writing them a blank check is unfair. We've tried, uh, we've tried this in the past and it's only invited further aggression from Saudi Arabia. There we go. As such, we believe offshore balancing is most effective in the, in the Middle East. And we want to clarify what specifically we mean. We want to utilize offshore balancing to stay separate from Saudi Arabia and Iran, enabling the United States to provide diplomatic de-escalation measures when one or both of those actors seek them, as they already have begun to. We do not want to pull out any troops from the region. We merely want to say we are not going to add any more. When Saudi Arabia asks us to help them specifically, as they have in the past, we are going to give, uh, give them an emphatic no. We don't want to end airstrikes in Yemen, but what we do want to do is make clear that we believe that Saudi Arabia and Iran, as they both have already said, 
are willing to, con uh, to come to a compromise in Yemen, and we want to be there to take those de-escalatory measures with them. Why specifically the importance of, uh, why specifically Yemen is so important uh, needs to be made clear. Both the Saudis and the Iranians both seem amenable to a decreasing involvement in there, and the distance from a strong government promises great instability in the short run, thus meaning that we can't simply wait for this conflict to peter itself out. We can't wait for one side to come to a decisive conclusion, uh, to, to a decisive victory, whether that's Iran or Saudi Arabia. Instead, what would be better is for both of them to pull out from the region. Next, we want to talk about the possibility of Syrian intervention and the utilization of Yemen, of Yemeni intervention as a blueprint for latter, uh, uh, for latter involvement in Syria. While Syria is much, uh, is much less well established for US-led de-escalation, the possibility that regional actors would once again be willing to de-escalate means that we're also willing to get involved there. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nicole Fernandes, and she's our Iran expert. Thank you, Asher. And as he said, I'm Nicole Fernandes, and I'm Team A's Iran expert. Um, many people view Iran as an increasingly aggressive, opportunistic state, and for good reason. There is a warranted concern for Iran's policies and actions in the Middle East, such as their intervention in Syria and Yemen, their sponsoring of terrorist groups, and their development of ballistic missiles, demonstrating their commitment to creating a possible vehicle for nuclear weapons. However, it is entirely incorrect to believe Iran is a hegemon or on the path to becoming one. Historically, Iran has always seemed to view expansion abroad as a way of strengthening domestic politics through increased nationalism and state building, as well as a way of limited criticism from hardliners in Iran. Yet, Iran's regime has consistently failed to manage other domestic pressures, threatening the legitimacy of the regime among its people and in the region. This domestic pressure limits Iran's expansion and ability to remain aggressive or become even more so in the region. The best example of this domestic pressure to stop pursuing expansive regional policies are this year's protests in Iran. These protests, centered around poverty and economic inequality, have demonstrated the Iranian people's strong discontent with the government. Citizens express concern over the government spending time and money on expansive regional policies, such as spending $10 billion in Syria rather than paying attention to domestic policies and their people's needs. Furthermore, Iran's involvement in proxy wars, as well as their development of ballistic missiles and potential desire for nuclear weapons, actually stems from both real and perceived threats to Iran's national security. Iran views Israel, and most especially Saudi Arabia, as states that pose a clear danger to Iran and its people, capable of threatening their security and pursuing military attacks which Iranian forces would not be able to counter. Iran is right to have these concerns, not only due to historical or present-day rivalries, but Israel has recently become more aggressive and threatening to Iran, trying to oppose their intervention in Syria at all costs. Just this May, Israel hit 50 Iranian assets in Syria, including airfields, intelligence sites, and observation posts. Although it is unlikely this will escalate into a war between the two sides, it is a reason for Iran to develop its offensive capabilities. Furthermore, the drastic difference in military spending between Iran and its neighboring states also gives Iran a reason to try to improve their weapon capabilities. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, this past year, Iran spent 3% of its GDP on its military, whereas Israel spent 5% and Saudi Arabia spent 10%. Thus, Iran's desire to develop ballistic missiles and potentially seek to develop nuclear weapons comes from the hope of improving their military weaknesses. Not only do these security threats and military weakness prevent Iran from becoming a hegemon, even with its aggressive regional policies in the Middle East, but Iran is also prevented by the sectarianism and religious differences with the majority of countries in the region. According to a demographic study by the Pew Research Center, Sunni Muslims make up 87 to 90 percent of the world's Muslim population, and only 10 to 13 percent are Shia Muslims. Of all the Shia Muslims in the world, about three-fourths of their population live in Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, or India. Thus, Iran would never really have the capability of becoming a hegemon or creating a sphere of influence in a region so heavily dominated by an opposing religious sect. Hence, Iran's eagerness to take advantage of weak states and engage in proxy wars, as well as their desire to develop more offensive weapons, is done from a place of insecurity. Iran intends to compensate for their lack of military power, as well as to mitigate the threat of neighboring states attacking them. So, even if it is Iran's intention to become a hegemon, they do not have enough government legitimacy or stability, the military capability, 
nor the long-term regional influence to do so. And Iran's regional threats are something the United States have the ability to deal with. So how are we to deal with Iran's aggression and the Saudi Arabia-Iran rivalry, as well as promote more stability in the region? The United States' decision to, do, to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal already signaled its opposition to Iran and its desire to acquire nuclear power or other offensive weapons. So what the United States must not do, first and foremost, is intervene militarily or try to contain Iran, as we would only inflame tensions between the U U.S. and Iran. Intervention would also risk empowering, empowering hardliners in Iran, increasing anti-American sentiment, and giving them the ability to use anti-American rhetoric to build a greater military arsenal, pursue nuclear weapons, and continue to be aggressive in the Middle East. In fact, any military intervention or containment strategy by the American government in the region will only serve to bolster Saudi Arabia, making Iran even more suspicious of increasing Saudi Arabian power in the region, as well as making Iran more insecure about their conventional military weaknesses. Thus, Iran will once again only become more aggressive, more likely to develop nuclear weapons, and more prepared to engage in a real war with Saudi Arabia. Not only would this be counterproductive and further destabilize the Middle East, but it risks getting the United States more involved in being pulled into a war that is not theirs to fight. Hence, in order to promote stability and decrease tensions between states in the region, we want to rely on diplomacy and encourage Iran to negotiate, particularly over Yemen. We believe Iran will come to the table and negotiate over Yemen for a few reasons, most especially due to the protests in Iran this year. As I mentioned earlier, Iranian citizens complained about their government's heavy spending on aggressive regional policies rather than focusing on large-scale unemployment, economic inequality, and other domestic issues. In order to decrease some of this public criticism, it is likely Iran will try to negotiate with Saudi Arabia over Yemen to attempt to stop fighting and investing money in a place with little return. In addition, in May, the Iranian deputy foreign minister claimed Iran wished to negotiate over Yemen, somewhat due to the severe losses the Houthis, a militant group in Yemen sponsored by Iran, had been suffering recently. Finally, we believe Iran will negotiate over Yemen because the Iranian government, headed by Rouhani, considers itself to be a reformist government that is more liberal and more open to dialogue and negotiation in comparison to historical and other hardliner regimes in Iran. So, for all these reasons, we wish to interact with Iran through diplomacy and believe they will negotiate over Yemen. However, in the case they do not come to the table, we still believe that the United States taking on a smaller role in the Middle East will enable Iran and tensions in the region to settle down. Now, I would like to hand it over to our Saudi Arabia expert, Anastasia. Good afternoon, my name is Anastasia, and like Nicole said, I am the Saudi Arabia expert for Team A. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a historical ally of the United States in the Middle East, with value as both a pillar of stability within that region and as a trading partner. It is our second largest trading partner in the Middle East, uh, with imports primarily of oil and exports of cars, arms, machinery. Presently, the country is locked in competition with Iran, with both countries having assumed maximalist positions in pursuit of regional hegemony. Certain elements of the foreign policy community, including our colleagues on Team B, may have you believe that the kingdom's rivalry with Iran and the putative threat posed by that country warrants support for Saudi Arabia in an escalation of the conflict and an attempt to roll back Iran and its proxies. This is not the case. Case: The cost of ex escalation is clearly visible in flashpoints around the region, particularly in Yemen, where Saudi and Iranian support for warring factions has created the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. Of less immediate humanitarian concern, but also deeply worrying from a strategic perspective, is the uncharacteristically assertive, even aggressive foreign policy pursued by Saudi Arabia under Crown Prince MBS and his father, King Salman. Their disagreements with Qatar's Emir Hamad and his son, the current Emir uh, Tamim bin Hamad, over, Irani over support for Iran and its allies has resulted in the, their blockade of that country with the help of the UAE, Bahrain, and other Gulf countries. Our sympathy, um, excuse me, our belief is that this competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia is based not primarily in ideological sectarianism, but rather security concerns, and that despite MBS comments about Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, Rouhani's Iran is not the next Nazi Germany. It simply isn't. As you will have noted in Asher's slide, the U.S. goals in the Middle East do not comprise a 
priority that we roll back Iranian influence. It may be a threat to Saudi Arabia in certain respects and to Saudi Arabian influence, but that is not the case for the United States. We cannot be dragged into conflicts that cost the United States a great deal in lives and money in pursuit of Saudi Arabian goals. Saudi Arabian and American interests, while compatible, are not identical. And it is in the best interest of the United States to return to a strategy of offshore balancing in the Middle East as a whole and with reference to the Saudi Arabian Iranian rivalry more generally. So, we welcome and fully support the domestic reforms currently being undertaken by Crown Prince MBS as part of Vision 2030 and the National Transformation Plan. These policies reflect long standing IMF recommendations for the necessary diversification of the Saudi economy and that will improve private sector growth as well as provide further employment opportunities for young citizens who comprise 45% of that country's population. To that end, we encourage the use of the Strategic Joint Consultative Group established during President Trump's visit to Riyadh in May 2017 as a venue for cooperation between the USA and Saudi Arabia on domestic development in conjunction with existing structures like the US-Saudi Joint Commission for Economic Cooperation. In particular, we encourage the revitalization of programs that facilitated the education of Saudi students at American universities. These numbers had risen tenfold in the years between 2000 and 2015, but declined in recent years due to a lack of support from both governments. While we welcome the progress that he's been making at home, actions orchestrated by MBS as in his previous role of defense minister, particularly Saudi Arabian involvement in Yemen, represent the type of military adventurism that does not benefit the United States and which we strongly discourage. Initially launched in 2015 as Operation Decisive Storm, Saudi Arabian involvement in Yemen has become a source of international embarrassment and condemnation for Saudi Arabia, <coughs> and particularly for its architect, Crown Prince MBS. The conflict has cost Saudi Arabia between 1,000 and 3,000 troops, and, in military, and it results in expenditures on military between five and six billion dollars per month. Furthermore, the lack of success has exposed MBS to the criticisms of his adversaries within the kingdom. 31 of the 34 princes on the Allegiance Council in Saudi Arabia supported the elevation of MBS to the role of crown prince, but many royals remain uncomfortable with his succession of his father. Therefore, it is in the United States' vested interest to ensure that his trademark policy for domestic improvement, Vision 2030, is a success, and that he refrains from engaging in further military ventures and life conflict in Yemen, which has cost him criticism at home and abroad. Our primary interest is in stability within Saudi Arabia. We must note the United States' refusal to further invest in Saudi military ventures in, is no indication of a cooling of the relationship between these two allies. Rather, it's an opportunity for us to wholeheartedly support the domestic reforms taking place within that country. Our policy of mediation between Iran and Saudi Arabia is hinged on the interest explicitly expressed by Saudi Arabia to end the conflict in Yemen and is not an example of further unwanted meddling in the Middle East. In addition to a series of leaked emails from MBS account published by Al Jazeera saying that he wanted out of the country, there have been numerous statements made by top diplomatic officials um, that have encouraged our belief that both Saudi Arabia and Iran would be amenable to coming to negotiations with Iraq as a mediator. Uh, particularly in an interview with Al Jazeera, uh, the Iraqi interior minister spoke about the fact that he'd been approached by both of these two countries and that they'd wanted to negotiate. Uh, this dialogue between Saudi and Arabia, Iraq and Iran is particularly reflective of the uh, rapprochement between Iraqi and Saudi Arabian officials in the recent years. Uh, this is evidenced by the opening of the Saudi embassy in Baghdad and the consulate in Najaf, the resumption of flights between the two countries for the first time since the 1990s, and the uh, rehabilitation of the Arar border crossing. So it was uh, the easing of sectarian tensions has been particularly clearly demonstrated by the visit of a Iraqi Shia cleric, Al Sadr, and his meeting with Crown Prince MBS in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the United States welcomes a sign of the easing of sectarian divisions <coughs> between the two countries, and we think that this is a symbol of the way in which, if you can move past sectarian divides, uh, there are possibilities for intra-regional solutions to these inter-regional conflicts um, that will not drag the U.S. into wars that are not theirs to fight. For more about the region, I will now turn it over to our regional expert, Angela. Hello, my name is Angela Yu, and I am our regional expert. So to reiterate, we propose that the United States does not further intervene in the conflict in the Middle East. 
Instead, we will move toward offshore balancing and use Iraq as a mediator between Saudi Arabia and Iran to begin to de-escalate the conflict in Yemen. Our policy emphasizes negotiations in Yemen as the conflict in Yemen is currently the most critical to the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran and the stability of the region. American attempts to reshape the region have two rarely sta achieved stated goals. Proponents of heavy American presence in the Middle East often justify it by pointing to a series of U.S. interests in the region. Yet, over the past few decades, however well intentions our actions have been, we have only succeeded in escalating the instability and insecurity in the Middle Eastern region. The U.S. way of intervention is to essentially remove leaders, attempt to withdraw, and ignore the stabilization phase of the region. The United States lacks the ability to establish a stable government after their intervention. Offshore balancing requires that the U.S. narrow its interests in the region and primarily prevent the rise of a regional, he regional hegemon that would threaten the United States' security. Proponents for further U.S. involvement often warn that the withdrawal of U.S. influences would let the region spiral further into insecurity, that regional leaders will take steps to exacerbate conflicts. However, this is a faulty assumption. These proponents assume that the United States has the ability to credibly defend and save other states, which is a misguided presumption. Our interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan have shown us that the United States simply does not have the tools to rebuild a state with a stable government after intervention. For us, it's a moral hazard, and we leave the region without having made it more secure or stable. Second, proponents assume that with the U.S. withdrawing, that regional, leaders, uh, regional actors cannot balance against one another to reach a more stable solution. However, we in fact believe that U.S. disengagement will allow Saudi Arabia and Iran to more productively seek negotiations and balance with one another to reach a more stable regional structure. The United States' interests do not align with the interests of the local groups of the region, and the United States cannot provide the tools to facilitate the interests of the disparate groups. Increasing U.S. involvement in the region carries the potential to entrap the United States in conflict and to encourage destabilizing behavior by both U.S. allies and adversaries. The United States does not want to expend more manpower or money in the region to resolve the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. We do not want another failed episode of attempted U.S. intervention. So given the current state in the Middle East, the United States, as an offshore balancer, will have the most productive time aiding de-escalation in Yemen. As an honest broker for negotiations between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the United States will not intervene in regional affairs and dig itself into another costly and ineffective war. As it stands, Yemen is one of the world's greatest humanitarian crises, divided into multiple areas of territorial and political control. Yemen is a country of many states, each with their own interests and conflicts. The Iranians are backing the Houthis, while Saudi Arabia has been leading a campaign to counter the Houthis and restore the Hadi government. Pro-independence leaders of successionist militias in the south have formed the Southern Transitional Council, which is also pushing for autonomy. Local groups have consolidated their powers and are controlling large swaths of territory, bringing in hundreds of billions of dollars a year in revenue by collecting taxes and selling oil. In Yemen today, nearly 7 million are at risk of famine and thousands have died in an outbreak of cholera. Yemen's crisis calls for immediate action to ease tensions between the two major conflict instigators in the state. The United States will have Iraq act as a mediator in the conflicts between Saudi Arabia and Iran, as both parties have expressed interest in Iraq as a facilitator of talks. The United States will lay out broad terms for the negotiation. One, both Saudi Arabia and Iran must begin to withdraw their support for groups within Yemen. Saudi Arabia has been backing the Hadi government, and Iran has been the main funders and supporters of the Houthi rebels. By having Saudi Arabia and Iran withdraw their support for the major, uh, major groups within the state, the tensions will begin to die down. Both parties are pr more prone to mediation than we presume and have expressed their disinterest in war and their interest for a compromise. Saudi Foreign Minister Adel al jaber expressed that the war in Yemen is not a war that they chose nor wanted. They are pushing back because of the militia backed by Iran and Hezbollah, which is in possession of ballistic missiles, which, is po which poses a threat to Saudi Arabia's security. Iran's foreign minister spoke that they would never actually want to stab Saudi Arabia in the back and they would now like to work something out. Iraq, second, Iraq will ask Saudi Arabia to cease its bombing in Yemen. The United States has been funding billions of dollars of weapons to Saudi Arabia, and if Saudi Arabia continues to use their weapons to exacerbate humanitarian crisis in the region, the United States will begin to stop, funding, stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia. In the Yemen conflict, the United States instruments are very limited. We do not intend on establishing a structured government within Yemen, but rather we would like to see the two major parties begin to de-escalate their violence in the region. 
The United States is content so long as the conflict in Yemen does not threaten the security of the United States or pose a threat to the economic interests of the United States. If the U.S. de-escalates the tensions in Yemen, the benefits are clear. Not only will the United States have made its interest in the region more secure, but the U.S. will have bolstered its image as a country as a facilitator of peaceful negotiations rather than a country that uproots governments and engages in unfounded militaristic actions. So the other major crisis in the Middle East is Syria. We believe that our policy in Yemen can also serve as a blueprint for uh, the crisis in Syria. They, there we are expecting a power shift, as MBS has recently been quoted saying that Bashar is staying. MBS is now coming to terms with Syria and accepting that Assad will remain in control. However, MBS's acceptance is contingent upon Assad's distancing from Iran. If Bashar commits to cur curbing Iranian presence as Saudi Arabia withdraws, MBS will allow the power shift back to Assad. With this, we, accept, we expect that Saudi Arabia will further be open to talks with Iran on potentially withdrawing their influence in Syria as well. Similar to our policies in Yemen, the United States will have Iraq as, act as a mediator for negotiations between Saudi Arabia and Iran to come to a stable deal which will allow both sides to withdraw their influence without being skeptical of the other party's commitment. As negotiations begin, it is likely that the tensions within Syria will begin to die down <coughs> as the country is left to Russia to deal with. Again, we do not expect that negotiations will lead to a stable Assad regime in Syria. However, such talks are expected to ease tensions in the Saudi-Iran rivalry and lead to de-escalation in the region. And with that, I'll hand the podium back to Asher, who will give our concluding remarks. Thank you so much, Angela. So just to briefly conclude, uh, as we've made our goals clear, I think we want to make more clear what exactly we believe and what we don't believe we're capable of accomplishing in the Middle East. First, as Angela and the rest of my group have made clear, this is not a promise of total peace in the Middle East. We aren't going to promise that we're going to immediately solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but what we are going to say is that we believe we have an attainable path to de-escalation. Once again, we believe that the United States is able to serve as a mediator between Saudi Arabia and Iran, making sure that they're balancing where they're capable, but also making sure that we're there to de-escalate when it's necessary. Because of the, uh, given the ability of both Yemen and to a lesser extent Syria to spread the instability that they have within their borders outside them, we believe that those two primarily are the best examples of where de-escalation is, is both necessary and given, uh, the, uh, given the interests of Saudi Arabia and Iran also possible. Balancing these powers will allow for greater, not only for greater regional stability, but less U.S. involvement, allowing us to achieve our goals at a lesser cost. Thank you so much. Okay. Start. Who'd like to get us started? All right. So um, enjoy the presentation. Uh, I feel like it's only fair that I throw a bunch of things at you guys since I threw some at the other team. Um, so a couple quick things. For Asher, Asher and Anastasia, um, you know, you had this list of Saudi goals, but you didn't list what I would have said as their number one goal, maybe because you just think it's implied, but regime security. You know, when you think about what the Saudis care about, yeah, they care about regional hegemony. Yeah, they care about pushing Iran back, but they care first and foremost about regime security or MBS security. So looking at that as the number one objective, does that shift any of your policies or your concerns about how the Saudis might perceive kind of offshore balancing because the bedrock of the U.S.-Saudi relationship is U.S. guarantee of Saudi regime security in many ways. And then they give us some stuff on the other side. So that'd be the first one. For Angela, you know, you say, talk about offshore balancing or, you know, Ash talks about offshore balancing. I think offshore balancing in this case is a big win for Iran. You know, Iran and the Saudis are not equally strong. I think that if the Irans and the Saudis slug it out, I mean, you guys presented um, stuff about the spending and, oh, you know, Saudis spend five times as much as Iran. Iran, I think, would still win in a straight-up fight and it wouldn't be close. So if the U.S. is backing off, that might seem like a neutral position from the U.S. perspective, but it's not going to be neutral in kind of the outcome. So I'm interested to know your thoughts on that. And then finally, for Nicole, um, you know, you had that map of the demographics and said, look, this is a Sunni region, and so Iran is just kind of demographically bound from being able to dominate it. And that might be true, but if you drew a box around Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, basically just that top part there of the Middle East, it's actually about 50-50 Sunni and Shia. 
And so when people talk about the Shia crescent with Iran, that's the region they focus on. And it's not surprising, perhaps, according to your logic, that the Iranians, of course, control their own country. They have great control in Iraq, significant control in Syria, significant control in Lebanon. So it might be difficult for them to control, say, the Sudan or some of the Gulf states. But in terms of that swath, which is very, very important politically, economically, et cetera, I don't think Iran is limited there. And they can have semi-regional hegemony if they control those countries. So they should know your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I, I assume the first question is for me, sure. right? Um, so, uh, you know, I'm t to be totally honest, yeah, that was a long kick. Can you just briefly restate it? Real quick for you is regime security. Right, you listed yeah. their favorite goals, uh, their number one goals, and you didn't even have that. Yeah, yeah. so I, yeah, I, I think you're probably right. That was definitely an oversight and maybe something we thought was implied. Still should have been on there. Um, I don't think that really changes it in a drastic way. And I think this sort of works in the second question of, you know, do I think in like a like a head-to-head -head battle in a vacuum, Iran versus Saudi Arabia. I mean, as you mentioned with Team B, obviously, you know, just the sheer manpower difference is huge. Uh, I think in a situation like that, yes, Saudi Arabia would probably not be the victor. But again, it's important to remember both what I said and I believe uh, the rest of my group brought it up as well. To assume that they're the only actors in the region is, of course, not true, right? Israel, as you also have said earlier, is, is becoming closer and closer with Saudi Arabia. I think when you take into account the larger region as a whole, it's not so clear that Saudi Arabia is clearly, you know, has a big issue with regime, with regime stability. It's not so clear that Iran would win. Um, so I think that's basically what I would say, both to respond to my question and also sort of send up for Angela to continue. Yeah, so the whole goal oh, of the United States... Yeah. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I meant Anastasia. Oh, I'm no, sorry. Right. Go ahead, Angela. <laughs> but I, I, either of you can answer, obviously. Oh, I would agree. <laughs> I would agree with Asher that I think that the Saudi inherent concern about their stability of their regime is not going to alter our interactions with them. And I think that MBS is aware of the way in which MBS and his father, of course, still uh, are aware of the way in which exploits in places like Yemen have just raised the risk of um, domestic criticism and that sort of thing. I think that, uh, <coughs> yes, I'm, I don't have anything more to add from what Asher said, essentially. Um, in terms of the, the unbalance in power, uh, the whole goal of the United States right now is to just de-escalate to a point where it won't pose a security threat to the United States. And in Yemen right now, Iran does have an upper hand because it has more Houthi rebels in the region. But we think that by having them come to talks that Iran, um, as Saudi Arabia and Iran have both expressed interest in sort of backing off, that they will be able to pull support back um, from Yemen. And as long as that doesn't pose a security threat to the United States, we are okay with that. And then in terms of, you know, um, Iran exerting power and influence in, like, Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq, um, I'd argue that, like, it's fine if they were to become, like, a semi-regional hegemon in those areas, just because I think, you know, in comparison, like, we talked about the military spending and whatnot, in comparison to, like, in Israel or Saudi Arabia, I think those two countries, like, gaining more influence in the area would be more problematic, just because... Um, they could definitely become regional hegemons, right? Um, because of the bigger, like, sunny Muslim population. So I think, like, even if Iran were to become a semi-regional hegemon, as you, like, put in your words, around that area, it wouldn't be necessarily a big deal if, like, those other um, powerful states could balance each other. Um, but, like, as of right now, like, our intention was not, you know, to create, like, perfect stability, right? But just making sure, like, it's de-escalated. Um, between these um, powerful states, so I think like with our policy, like we'd be able to do that, and I don't think like it would necessarily be a big deal if you know Iran was exerting influence in those states, as long as eventually it would become more stable. Yeah, and, and the, the only thing I'll say country. is the Israelis and the Saudis would certainly think that's a big deal. I mean, they would not see an Iran that's dominant in Iraq and Syria and Lebanon as a small thing that didn't threaten them. The Israelis are very, very concerned about getting Iran out of Syria right now. That's why they're launching airstrikes into Syria. The Saudis see Iranian presence in those areas as a real problem as well. So I don't know if they, you know, I think you guys are correct, actually, that you can make a strong argument. It doesn't really threaten U.S. security directly that much. But I think it does threaten Saudi and Israeli security. I'm, and I, again, I, I would not disagree, but I would think a couple of things that first, you know, you're absolutely right that, you know, within the Shia Crescent, Iran is set up to have some, to have more influence there than Saudi Arabia is. But that's not to say that in a situation like Assyria or Lebanon, where, you know, the split really is 50-50, that they're ever going to have as much influence there as they would in their own country, uh, just given the demographic trend. So, I, uh, but, and secondly, um, I think your question about to what extent should we be concerned that, you know, Israel and, um, 
and Saudi Arabia would be threatened by that sort of gets to the crux of our presentation, which is like, I don't want to say who cares, but to what extent are we comfortable with them not being completely, completely uh, comfortable with what's going on in the region? Do we think that they're that they're like um, that that's in any way like a serious threat to their regional to their regime stability? I don't think so. I don't think that you know. Uh, either MBS or Netanyahu seriously believe that you know that's going to at the end of the day lead to you know Jerusalem in ruins, Tel Aviv in ruins, Riyadh in ruins. Um, and if they do, I ask, I basically say you know I, I think they're being a little bit hyperbolic. And I think as long as those regional actors are existent and largely successful, I think we can be okay with that, even if they're not you know getting exactly what they want. And I think, oh, sorry. Oh, please. Uh, so, you know, strategies can either be articulated or sometimes they can actually be concealed and partially revealed. And so, you know, I think with regard to what you've communicated here, the Yemen piece and even the Syrian piece to a degree, it doesn't look controversial to me. It looks like it's something that in the American context would be digested and probably get quite a bit of support and to see the utility of it. That said, <coughs> I think that there would be a significant domestic political challenge with this course of action, uh, particularly as it rel relates to how Israel would perceive this and how that would impact American politics. So my question to you is if the president was looking at this and say, you know, I see a lot of logic and uh, you know, some persuasiveness in pursuing some of these initiatives, particularly since he doesn't want to spend a lot of money in that place and see some utility in backing off militarily, even if staying involved diplomatically. To, how would you address this? I mean, would, would, you, would you then be comfortable and would you recommend to the president that he doesn't necessarily have to call this offshore balancing? He doesn't even have to call it, I think at one point you called it disengagement, although you could really disagree with that, say this is absolutely engagement, just a different kind of statecraft, not, not leading with our chin. So how, how would you, if the president sort of was ruminating about this, and said, look, I, I kind of like this. I'd love to get a res resolution in Yemen, but how do I deal with this domestic problem? How would you respond to that? Well, I think that there's a lot of value in emphasizing that this is a balancing of Saudi Arabia and Iran against one another, and that this is not necessarily, though Israel might perceive it as limited U.S. engagement, we are keeping the troops that we have in the Middle East in the Middle East. We can emphasize those, that, those points of continuity in terms of we're not reneging on our support for our allies within the region. We're just trying to prevent the U.S. from being dragged further into a conflict, which I think does play very well to a domestic audience. But, but to push you just for a second, you know, of the course. assumption you talked about, you said, well, you know, this isn't really possibility, this regional um, hegemony, because, well, if you look at the way it's arrayed, Sunni and Shia, I just sure. want to uh, back up what uh, Professor Krauss was saying, that, you know, remember in Iraq, you had uh, 20 to 25 percent of the country really not only governing, but quite frankly, even oppressing the other 75 percent. So w if that was ever listed as an assumption, you would get a fair amount of people who would be pushing back right away and say, no, no, we're concerned about Iran. And, and we, don't, we don't see it as that benign. We see this as potentially a real problem. And so that's really the burden of my question is, is how does this, which has some practicality, get filtered through the American process so that it can be supported? Because that's the thing about the United States is it has to be supported. I mean, it's really hard to go out on a limb and have an unsupported strategy. I mean, or I, I assume then you're referring to humanitarian concerns in the same way that we had within Iraq arising in, in Syria. Well, even quite frankly, um, or, yielding the point that, well, Iran is, has, is going to have so much influence in this region. Just that itself would be a controversial statement. Uh, so how would you, given the fact that it's central to your course of action, and, and, and I don't mean to even discredit no, it, no, I'm no. just saying, because I actually think there's some merit in what you're doing here, but how do you get this done? How, how, do, you, how, how do you take the specifics of what I think there is real erudite you know, possibilities here, but how do you then get it to have currency so that a president will accept it and do it, given the domestic politics concerns? Do you think that, or, or maybe you push back and say, no, the, the president will be brave and do it? Well, I think that there will certainly be concerns, partially just because of the way that Iran has been, the way Iran is perceived by the general American public and the way that rhetoric surrounding Iran has been propagated by politicians for years and years and years. And so I think part of it involves reframing Iran as not this existential threat to the United States or even an existential threat to other players within the region, but as a country that's interested in its own security. And I think that that is something that is a long-term process and difficult in political terms, but something that w which can be accomplished if we're going to pursue a policy like the one that we proposed over a significant period of time. So I think that's one element of it. And I would argue as well that, um, forgive me, I lost my train of thought. 
Yeah, so essentially reframing how Iran is perceived by the general American public and also emphasizing again that this is in U the U.S. best interest not to become further entangled in conflicts in the Middle East. Yeah, and I think those are the two key selling points. Can we go back to Professor so I'm, I'm curious about how you would respond to the idea that where the U.S. has been less active and has in some sense sort of taken a, a backseat, Iran has kind of filled in that vacuum. Um, and how do you prevent that from happening if, if we were to follow your, your strategy? I mean, if, if I can just, I, I think to me at least it, it's pretty clear that the reason that when the U.S. has only partially taken a backseat, that Saudi Arabia and Israel haven't then got, uh, sort of, you know, said we're going to really take a stand here is because there's still some sort of underlying assumption or, you know, uh, belief that the United States will eventually come in and fill that power vacuum. This sort of, you know, tenuous relationship that I believe has developed and I think our policy in general, we believe, has developed where, you know, we sort of have, uh, have become, you know, a, a supporter to the point, uh, for Saudi Arabia and Israel to the extent that they're not necessarily willing to take those actions, actually balance effectively, they sort of expect us to do the balancing against Iran, is why that balance, we haven't seen that balancing in the past. So, I guess it's t not totally clear to me what the policy is. So if you're keeping U.S. troops there, as you just said, how are you showing that we wouldn't be the one to step in and, and, and do it? So, so the idea is that the U.S. troops stay there, but they're <coughs> mostly there as a defensive. We're not using them to actually intervene or try to contain any state. But we're trying to, so as the U.S. sort of backs off as an off offshore balancer, we want the U Iran and Saudi Arabia to sort of step up on negotiations in Yemen so that it can, the, the conflicts in Yemen can de-escalate for the long term rather than having the United States consistently there and going in to resolve the conflict. I mean, it doesn't seem to me that, that some promise of U.S. involvement has been sort of the problem in creating Yemen in the first place. So what, why does resolving Yemen, where the U.S. hasn't played a huge role anyway, kind of is the key to solving everything for you here? So a lot of your policy rests on sort of figure out Yemen, negotiate Yemen. Yemen can be a blueprint for Syria, but I'm not, it's not clear to me like why that signals that the U.S. is sort of taking a back seat and why this would solve kind of this, this problem in the region. I, sorry. So I wanna you could clarify. So, 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 so um, we, the U.S. is only interested in getting involved in the region as far as U.S. security concerns are um, in question. So. By we see Yemen as sort of the major conflict between the two states right now, and if the United States is able to sort of de-escalate that, we think that the U.S. security will not be threatened, or nor are our econ economic interests going to be threatened. So it's like a critical point right now for the United States um, because we think that that is the the critical area where United States could be threatened. So U.S. security is threatened by the conflict in in Yemen. Is U.S. goals, sorry. U.S. goals? Yeah. Well, what happens tomorrow if, say this gets accepted and you're moving along, and then uh, Iran comes out and says, we're going to start enriching again? How, how, how does that, what does that do to what your course of action is here? Uh, we think, well, we, we will try to facilitate talks between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And if they, to, to whatever extent that they do, agree to come to some kind of a negotiation, at least the tensions will st begin to die down as they start to come to talks. Um, we do not, we, we cannot promise that they will be able to create peace in Yemen, um, but hopefully the tensions will be able to start dying down. I mean, the UN envoy has been trying to create talks for a long time and they have talks and then they fall apart, and so why, what change is that? Here. And isn't the U.S. getting involved rather than like the U.N. envoy more involvement rather than a de-escalatory kind of? Well, the U.N. Um, created resolution 2216 that asked for uh, the Houthi rebels to sort of withdraw everything and try to insert um, one person in power. But that's not going to work because um, the Houthis want more power. They want more territory and they're not going to back off unless we think, we believe that Iran and Saudi Arabia come to talks to sort of both sides begin to withdraw rather than have the Houthis withdraw. I'm, I'm sorry, were, were you asking about Yemen or nuclear weapons? I was, I was asking about, well, they, 
Yeah, I was asking that. Yeah. So, and okay. what I'm basically he was saying that is, what, oh, if, okay. what if you're getting, successful? What if you're successful? What if this actually leads to some progress in Yemen, but then they decide at the same time they're going to start to enriching again? Because part of this is all based on, well, you know, Iran is is capable of a different kind of Iran, and in most of America that's engaged in this, they would have a hard time believing that, but maybe, you know. And then all of a sudden you start to have these tensions. You have this dual track situation. How does that impact your what you're trying to do here? I mean, I, I would say that, I would say a couple of things. First of all, um, in, my, in my initial slide, uh, sort of outlining our policy, I made clear that, you know, we, while the United States has largely taken a role of offshore balancing, we do retain the right, and like we're making clear that, you know, in specific situations, in a Yemen, in a Syria, where there's particular violence, uh, or like the threat of violence as there would be in nuclear weapons, we are not saying we're going to remain entirely, entirely uninvolved. Secondly, though, I'm not really clear that that's something that is, you know, unique to this policy, right? I don't think, I, I and I, maybe I misunderstood you, but it's, it's not clear to me why this would make Iran particularly more likely to enrich uranium, given that they probably have the capacity to do that now. They've had the capacity to do that for a while, and then they would never really get up to nuclear weapons capacity, right? They'd get it past uh, what you'd need for energy, but they'd never really take it that far. So it always seemed like they were playing a little bit of a game. I'm not sure why that game would totally change. Like, So I have a question about kind of how you frame your broader policy and what it means. So on the one hand, you're talking about offshore balancing. Offshore balancing, as I understand it, is trying to prevent the rise of regional hegemon. And these little fires here and there, that's what offshore balance is supposed to be great about. Like, you don't really get involved in that stuff. You know, it, it doesn't really worry you because you're not worried about the rise of this big power. But at the same time, you guys focus, like, so much of your presentation on Yemen. Like, Yemen is this big linchpin. And, you know, Yemen, to me, first off, I think you guys treat it as much more of a proxy war than it is. It's not just, like, the Saudi side against the Iranian side. You know, there's, like, four-plus sides that were fighting way before the Iranians were significantly involved. And if all of a sudden Yemen is solved tomorrow, I, I just don't think the Iranian-Saudi rivalry is going to go away. So I guess I'm trying to fully understand your policy <coughs> in terms of, like, how much of it is putting out little fires because you just want less humanitarian crises or you think this some like, like gins up sectarianism in the region versus are you really just concerned about, like what you said other times, we don't want the rise of regional hegemon, we'll prevent that, but short of that, we're kind of getting out and not paying the cost of doing this stuff. Like, I don't fully understand because the Yemen stuff, I understand like, oh, it's negotiation, we want it to end, but as Professor Erickson says, I don't think it's just going to end real quickly by saying, oh, we should negotiate. You know, it's going to take a more almost, if not aggressive, than involved U.S. presence to make that happen. So what exactly are you aiming for here? Are you aiming for just putting out these fires that are currently going, preventing future fires, coming to some type of real politique agreement, like detente between Saudi and Iran? Like, what's the end game? Sure. So I think that part of our general policy is the idea where Yemen came into our policy initially is that both sides had expressed interest in de-escalating the conflict explicitly and publicly. And so our view is that the United States can become involved in a situation like that where we want to act as a facilitator and involve Iraq as well so that it becomes a regional effort. And that that is not dragging us further into the conflict. So the U.S. stops, it doesn't stop, but it perhaps puts limits on the arms that it's selling to Saudi Arabia to further the conflict. And by removing the key funding that is received by the two sides, two sides that are directly funded by Iran and Saudi Arabia in the conflict that will de-escalate the situation more generally. And it might not result in immediate peace, but it also relieves the tensions in what is one of like the hottest spots in this conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia for regional hegemony. So that cools off competition between those two countries. And I think that in terms of more generally, how does this reflect on U.S. involvement in the region, we're not getting involved militarily in Yemen. That's not our suggestion at all. We're saying that we become involved in a diplomatic capacity in a way that by uh, acting as a facilitator between the two sides, just the two sides, um, the U.N. hasn't been successful in doing and other efforts have not been successful so far. Okay. I have a question for Anastasia. Um, LSR of Team B uh, really wants American policy to back MBS to the hilt. What is Team A's perspective on, on MBS? Uh, how are you more cautious than, than LSR? Sure. Uh, so I think that we certainly welcome the overtures that for towards reform that MBS is making at home, uh, but we are worried by his tendency to become more assertive abroad. And so in that respect, we would like to redirect his efforts away from uh, 
military actions and towards really throwing himself wholeheartedly into those domestic reforms, which I think, and to your question earlier about regime stability being a priority of Saudi Arabia, I think that the greatest risk of instability, or, or uh, the greatest threat to the regime would arise from domestic instability. And so we think that by uh, supporting these efforts like the National Transformation Plan, Vision 2030, that will both shore up his stability at home and prevent him from acting more aggressively abroad. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, LSR has basically argued that American <laughs> policy should <laughs> ignore MBS's, you know, arresting uh, of his right. rival, seizure and seizure of his property. When, in your view, should America start to get concerned about um, his, you know, the, the power he's amassing within South Korea? Well, I think that yes, holding people hostage in the Ritz-Carlton is questionable in terms of an ally of the United States. Uh, and that's something that we need to be careful of. I think that at this point, it, he's the value that he provides as a pillar of stability is of greater importance than questionable business or political practices at home as long as this is a long going issue with Saudi Arabia. How do we balance human rights and et cetera? And so I think that at this point, MBS hasn't done anything so drastic that we need to revoke support. That would be highly dangerous. But to keep a wary eye on it, we don't give him our wholehearted support in everything that he does. Okay, so we have time for about one or two more questions, perhaps a question from Team B. Okay, not to hound on you about the MBS <laughs> stuff. But um, so you're saying that <laughs> but um, you're saying that like what you want to do is like redirect his attention to domestic affairs, right? So his um, vision twenty thirty. And like I guess the issue that I see with that is like how can he focus on his on vision twenty thirty when he has Yemen in his backyard? attacking him like it that like he's going to be so pre preoccupied with all these external factors that he's not going to be able to focus on internal struggles um so i guess it's like how do you reconciliate that reconcile sorry reconcile, reconcile. <laughs> reconcile that reconcile. <laughs> sure. um that's why we're negotiating yemen i was going to say that's <laughs> the idea behind the de-escalation of the conflict in yemen primarily uh giving oh. um yeah, um, so I kind of have like a two-part thing on the domestic like side of Iran. Um, so earlier in your presentation, you argued that Iran isn't naturally like um, expansionist or like has hegemonic um, desires. You said that's because its expansionist tendencies were driven by a nationalistic uh, population, but then also that domestic pressures would stop it from expanding more. So it kind of sounds like Iran's population has to make up its mind on which one it is. Um, so I guess, I, I, like, how you reconcile those two. And then the other thing is, um, on the domestic pressures, you assume that domestic pressures are going to bring the Iranian government to the bargaining table and negotiate with other parties. Um, my question on that is um, actually a little bit removed. Uh, are you going to continue the Trump administration's sanctions on Iran, or are you going to just, you know, essentially, like, redo the re-enter the JCPOA, because then if you are, you're getting rid of a lot of the conditions that allowed for those protests and um, domestic um, unrest in the first place. Um, so for the first question, I actually, in my presentation, I probably didn't make this clear, but I was said that historically, like Iran's regime, like the people in power um, are looking like to expand abroad, yes, to like increase a sense of like nationalism and pride because like their economy is not like going too well, right? Um, and but while they're trying to do that, they're spending so much money trying to you know like create influence and power in the region, and their economy and their uh, is suffering and like domestic issues um, are continuing to occur. So like you know like you said in your presentation, the employment rate is like I don't know twenty five percent for people who are you know under age thirty or something like that. Um, so I think that you know the regime is like oh like we need to do this in order for the people to be more content. Right, like we need to expand abroad so we can like have power and influence and like be a big like powerful state. But then at the same time, they're suffering from like these domestic issues. And now finally, like the people are saying like you need to pay attention to what's going on inside your own country. Um, so I think like the domestic pressure is coming like from both ways. You know, like you have like some soft whispers or loud voices in the hardliners rather that are like, oh, like let's expand abroad and like make make <laughs> Iran a powerful state. But then like the majority of the younger generations now are like, you know, able to protest and be like, no, don't do that. Stop spending um, money and like, please focus on like 
domestic issues and domestic policies. So I think that's why, you know, Iran is going to have trouble, like, creating or becoming a solid hegemon. Like, that was one of my points, just because they're facing so much domestic pressure at home that is, like, you know, contradictory, um, but, and is just, like, kind of delegitimizing the regime. Um, so that was, like, I think answers your first question. And then your second question was about Sanctions. Sanctions, okay. Um, so, like, we uh, were thinking about, like, what we would do about the economic sanctions with the Trump administration. Um, we definitely, for, for, for the first thing I want to say is, like, we wouldn't re-enter into the JCPOA um, just because, like, what's done is done. Um, and that, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, like, has shown us that we, like, oppose um, Iran, like, um, you know, going against the nuclear deal and whatnot, um, and like oppose them getting nuclear weapons at all, you know, and having the ability to get it um, like in the future, right? Um, because that's what the nuclear deal enabled them to do. But in terms of sanctions, um, since the Trump administration um, were to keep the economic sanctions on, we thought, you know, like that was enough of like something that hurts the economy that like, you know, Iran wouldn't be able to like you said, potentially um, increase their military spending, right? Um, so potentially would hinder their ability to be aggressive. But then we also were like, oh, well, if we, you know, take off the economic sanctions, does that give them, like, too much power to, you know, um, increase, like, spending or do whatever? Um, so I think, like, as, like, as a team, we were thinking um, probably, like, mitigating the sanctions. Um, but it, but, like... But, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, no. <laughs> um, probably like that's potentially like in the future. So as of right now, we would keep Trump's sanctions on. Yeah. Yes. Um. How do you envision Iraq as a fair mediator when it is currently economically and politically influenced by Iran? I mean, we aren't really as concerned to what extent it is a fair mediator. But given that both parties seem interested in it mediating. That seems like a fair mediator. Um, again, I mean, to me, it seems that given given the fact that you know Iran has some level of influence, uh, that might sway them. But you know, in the same way, Saudi Arabia has some sort of influence in Iraq. And given the fact that Saudi Arabia themselves uh, said, "Hey, we want Iraq to mediate," sounds like Saudi Arabia would be okay with it. So, I don't really see that as a big issue. And with that, I'd like to take a round of applause. Announcements.